Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Corbett, your host. And with me, once again, is none other than Mr. Brandon Noway. Brandon, how you doing today, buddy? Yeah, I ain't here. I'm not doing half bad. How about you? I'm fantastic as being a fan for opening week. And man, it is exciting. Anybody who doesn't know what's going on, shame on them. Because as you and I know, the first week of baseball brings plenty of firsts. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And kind of some of the other stuff we'll talk about today. Talk about opening day with a snowy day. We're going to talk about Turner's wrong turn. And then we got a lot going down the rundown. What's some of the stuff you get going with the rundown today, Brandon? We got a ton of stuff. Even though we're already a week into the season, we already have our first suspension of the year. Ooh. We're going to be talking Yankees, Braves, Red Sox, Dodgers, Trevor Bauer, and and a lot more. So stay tuned for that. Well, there's plenty there. <laughs> and uh, on top of that, too, we have a special interview with Mr. Lou Schiff, the Honorable Lou Schiff. He is a big, 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 big baseball Marlins fan. Also, he has a great Twitter that you guys should look at. It's called Baseball in the Law. Lou is a judge and... He's also likes a, a big baseball aficionado. He was there on opening day at Marlins Park, and he's going to share with us his insights of what that was like at the beginning of the 2020 season. I think that's um, most all of what we've got here today. So let's get rolling. And it starts with snow. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent baseball weather. Excellent baseball weather in 2020. And you and I were bantering back and forth a while back saying, really, shouldn't they have the first, oh, couple of weeks of games, at least just at the Southern Parks? Shouldn't somebody who's ever working up the scheduling for MLB have that as part of their mindset? I have to agree with you. <laughs> I mean, it, it looked cool, but I don't know, watching the highlights of the game, I couldn't see the ball at all. I don't know how people there could, but at least on TV, I couldn't. Oh, I, I couldn't either. I mean. What's that old saying? On a clear day, you can see forever. Well, it wasn't clear. <laughs> it was snowy. <laughs> and uh, Miguel Cabrera, I, I, I know most of you guys may have seen this yet. If you haven't, please check it out on YouTube. You talk about heads up baseball, trying to be aware where that ball is. Man, you're looking in the sky. There's nothing but big, giant, white snowflakes falling to the ground. <laughs> and there's somewhere there's a baseball up there. And what happened was Miguel Cabrera, on opening day, he hit a home run. He didn't know it. There he is. And Mr. Detroit Tiger Miguel Cabrera slid into second on a home run and then looked up and said, oh, somebody's whirling their finger around pointing out, guess what? You had a home run. So they didn't, they didn't hold it against him. He completed his run all the way to home and made uh, one, one of the most, I think, interesting stories for opening day. I mean, I knew it was it was a homer just watching the highlight. I still couldn't find the ball where it was landing. <laughs> yeah, you can they can track it with the cameras sometimes, but the, the human eye is something else entirely different. Well, let's talk about another little fun, if you will. Maybe not so much fun for somebody. And we're talking about wrong turn turner. <laughs> and I'm talking about the guy who last year when they won the World Series, who had been said, guess what, you got COVID, you can't go back out of the field. He did. Well, he made another wrong turn in the first game of 2020. I was watching this live, and I was pulling my hair out. I said, you can't do that. you got to be aware, buddy. What did he need to be aware of? Well, the ball was hit. That's always great. And you're on base, and you're Justin Turner, and you're saying, oh, good, my teammate Cody Bellinger here, he's – he just hit he just hit that ball and it's a home run. Oh, no, it's not a home run. I better get back to first. Well, at this point, Bellinger, he know who has he knows he has a home run. And is going to get ready to run across the bases. Well, as Bellinger hits first, starts heading toward second, his teammate, Justin Turner, who left first, now has turned around and is heading back to first in fear that Bellinger's hit was not a home run, but was an out. But um, Bellinger's at this point, he's just kind of standing between first and second saying, hey, see me? I'm, I'm waving my little finger around here to signal for a home run. Hey, Turner, 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 stop. And, and Turner comes running back from second. Uh, it, it wasn't where it was going to be a collision, but 
if he opened his eyes and paid attention to the play, he'd realize that Bellinger was there. And they were passing one another. Guess what was going to happen from that? Boom. Well, yeah, Bellinger's out because he, he, he passed a, a player. Hey, I give him credit, though. Trying to find the, the bright side of it, he kept his head down and he hustled back to first base. It cost him a run in and out, but he hustled and kept his head down. He did. He kept his head down too much, but he definitely hustled. So congrats on the hustle, Turner. And while the umpires were scratching their head for a few seconds, they had to figure out what it was going to be. They ruled that Turner could complete a run across the bases from Bellinger's hit and that Bellinger then was awarded an RBI, but no home run. And what else did you? Uh, they gave Bellinger a single. Yeah. Oh, wait, they counted it as a single, but they also gave him an out. That was weird. So he got the RBI on that. One. So, But it is opening day, and you're looking for weirdness, and you don't have to look too far. So, Okay, so now after wrong turn, turn, what do we got left? Well, there's some other exciting things happening today. One of them, and that is with a White Sox and Angels game. Every time I hear Angels, the first thing I think of is, you know, Mr. Trout, Mike Trout. But other things happen out there, too. And during that game, a newbie, if you will, German Mercedes, the Mercedes drove five for five. <laughs> oh, bad pun. Nice dad joke. <laughs> yeah, it is. That tells you a lot. So this guy, <laughs> he he's 28-year-old, tw- uh, <laughs> No, uh, tw- he was number 21 prospect, so 28 years old, he was just still a prospect. Go figure. But he, he, he's doing that. And you're saying, well, that's an interesting game. And I think they actually won that one. I think it was like 12 to 6. Anyway. But anyway, they did win the game. But he was up against you know, a, a fantastic pitcher, Shohei Otani. And looking at this year, the coach, excuse me, the manager – for the Angels, Mr. Madden, he said in February, the rules are there aren't going to be any rules. And that's certainly what he did when it came to putting into action the man on the mound. Can you give us a little bit of information there about Mr. Otani? Otani was out there, and a fun fact that came from Moses Messina, I, I believe that's how you pronounce it, he put on Twitter that Otani is the first starting pitcher to hit seconds since Jack Dunleavy on September 7th, 1903 for the St. Louis Cardinals. And Otani went on to hit a home run in his first at bat. In a stat courtesy of Alden Gonzalez of ESPN, he wrote an article, quote, who be- he began the night by throwing a baseball 101 in the top of the first inning and hitting a baseball 115 miles per hour in the bottom of the first, which was a 451-foot homer, Otani's 100-mile-an-hour pitch to Adam Eaton helped set up his first strikeout, which was the fastest pitch thrown by any starting pitcher so far this season, or at least at the time. And Otani's home run had an exit velocity of 115.2 miles an hour, was the hardest-hit homer of the season by any player, but he unfortunately left the game in the fifth after being slid into at home plate. But everybody is saying that he is going to be fine. I'm glad to hear he's going to be fine, but I, I, I'm amazed about this. I mean, one, that they did put him in the number two slot in the lineup. Say, oh, yeah, we're going to put a, pitch, put a pitcher right there. That just seemed crazy. <laughs> you know, I actually, being a fan of the American League, I don't, pay much, I don't pay enough attention to designated hitters, but, man, did he make a difference with that. I mean, to think that both on the mound and what he was able to do at, at the bat, at the plate, and that amazes me. And to achieve both of those things in one game, as far as the speed and velocity, that is huge. Yeah, it's amazing what he can do. And doing it at the major league level, which you really haven't seen in over 100 years. And we, of course, have it in Brendan McKay. And it it's going to be something worth watching over the next few years, you know, how doing both sides of the ball affects the other. Because you can only really be great at one, or can he prove the impossible and be great at both of them? You know, sort of, if you want things done, you got to do it yourself. Absolutely. I mean, and that's, that comes down to it. 
Otani is the example of exactly how to achieve that. But it, it did bring to mind another opening day game, and that was with the Marlins and the Rays. The Rays, their top pitcher these days, they put him out there, Mr. Glass now, Mr. Tyler Glass now. And he's doing fantastic up there on the mound. But then he's he's playing in the National League game, so he has to go up there. There's no designated hitter. He's up there at the plate. And let's see. I mean, I don't think he took any swings, man. He didn't take any swings at all. He just up there saving his arm. And I, I guess they could have put a toy bat in his hand. It wouldn't make any difference as far as his participating. Yeah, to me, that's exhibit A of why there should be the universal DH, because that was honestly pretty much just a waste of everybody's time. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the movie Benchwarmers, but he kind of looked like John Hedder up there, where he was just standing, didn't know what he was doing. He was just up there at the plate trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah, and that was a little crazy. But I'm kind of thinking of the other side of that, too. One, I'm I'm like, I'm fine about getting rid of it altogether. No DH. but. If you're going to have it, I think that the offense should have the advantage of making a decision. And I would say, oh, what? Like an intentional strikeout, okay? <laughs> if you've got the defense out there saying, we're going to go ahead and walk you, then you should have the offense be able to say, you know what? We're going to defer <laughs> any hits for <laughs> our player, and we're going to go ahead. We'll accept a strikeout, okay? Just go ahead and scratch it on there. I don't even want glass now out there at home play uh, batting because anything can happen, an injury. You know, he could get hit by pitch, and anything like that. He could strain himself trying to hit the ball and not be great on the mound. I, I, I'm not of the same mind on that one, Brandon. So, And make sure we have an intentional strikeout ability for the offense to call. Yeah, I, I'm perfectly fine with that. Like I said, it, it saves time, and the pitcher doesn't embarrass himself up at the plate, although that would take out the – Bartolo Colon home runs, the joy that that would bring us. And I do like it would prevent injury because God forbid something like a Tatis injury that happened over the weekend happened to Glass now or any other starting pitcher who's playing in an NL, NL game. <laughs> there's excitement that could be had and there's potential for injury. We'll get to some of that in a minute. But right now, let's go into to Brandon. Are you ready for the rundown? I am. Bring it, brother. Yeah, so if you listened last year, did the rundown, or, or, you know, basically just read off the score, so we thought we'd change it up this year and basically read off some of the highlights. So we'll start off in Boston, where the Red Sox were off to their worst start at home, 0-3, in 73 years, and that was since 1948, where they were swept by Baltimore. <laughs> and they were once considered a dark horse to make the playoffs, and then the medicine to their woes came to town, that being the Tampa Bay Rays. <laughs> and good for them they got back on track unfortunately for the Rays they went off track and they're now in last place in the division the Blue Jays one of our favorite teams they, they're they coming alive they took 2 or 3 against the Yankees with Vlad Jr. reaching base on half of his plate appearance and they look like a team that honestly can win one nothing or 7-6 to six. That, that, that honestly I think will make them very dangerous going forward They've, I mean, they've come alive, like you said, this year. They've, they're just spanking wild. Uh, I was looking at Vlad Jr. I saw some notes that he's actually lost like about 24 pounds in the offseason. He looks, he looks like solid up there, and he's still going to make a difference. Yeah, and, and sticking with that series, Gary is scary, as John Sterling says in one of his radio calls. In that series, he hit two home runs and had three of the eight RBIs for the Yankees against the Blue Jays. MLB.com in an article was quoted as saying, The Astros are back, baby. Houston isn't just 4-0. It has five different regulars with an OPS over 1,000. Who needs George Springer? And to that, I simply say, keep it in your pants. It's the first week. And a fun fact, since Oakland won the West last year, Houston has won seven of the last eight. And just to put a little bit of a damper on the parade, Oakland isn't exactly what they were last year, considering they got rid of arguably their best players with Marcus Simeon. And they also, on their road trip to L.A., had trash cans thrown on the field. Some of them were real and full of real trash, and some of them were 
blow up, sort of like balloons, were thrown on the field at, in Angel Stadium. They had to have the opportunity last year to just go ahead and ex- express their dismay with the Astros. You know, you look at that, you saw the core had been slapped, you saw the hinge had been slapped, and that the players walked away with nothing. So a lot of fans are still angry about that, and I think the Astros are going to still hear about that over, you know, at least the first part of this year. Yeah, and I look forward to them keep trying to play the victim card like they have in the past year and a half, and for when they take their road trip up to the Bronx and face the Yankee fans, which is going to be ruthless, and I'm here for it. I can't not wait to watch that. <laughs> it should be fun. All right, heading down to the city of brotherly love that was home to the worst bullpen in baseball last year with the Phillies that posted the second worst ERA in MLB history with a 7.06 ERA. That comes courtesy of Matt Rapa of that's baseballs out of here.com or excuse me, that balls out of here.com. Philadelphia's bullpen pitched seven and a third innings against Atlanta and didn't give up any runs, which is a big step from last year. And sticking with Atlanta, their big three, also known as the MV3 of Freeman, Acuna, and Azuna, went three for 32 against the Phillies and only scored three runs. And honestly, if you're any team in any sport, really, if your big three go into a slump at the same time, you're probably not going to win anything. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about three big-time performers here. I mean, Freddie Freeman, Acuna Jr., uh, Ozuna. I'm looking at stats and seeing, let's say, Acuna last year. Let's see, he's 23 years old, and he, let's see, 250. His batting average is 250 in 46 games. Freeman was 341, and Ozuna was 338. Wow. Okay, let's see, Acuna 2250, Freeman 341. And Ozuna, 338. Bing. And I believe last year, at our, like, our end of year award, award show we did, didn't we have all three of them in our MVP candidate race, at least for the NL? Yeah, yeah, we did. So I don't know. I mean, this is the thing about opening week. It's almost like spring training. <laughs> is it? Is it going to count? Like I said, it would be a tenth of what <laughs> of the season of last year, but we've got plenty of time with 162 games. All right, heading up to Ohio, where Nick Castellanos, well, he was suspended two games for, quote, his aggressive actions and for instigating a benches-clearing incident. He was hit by pitcher John Woodford of the Cardinals, and then when he scored on a wild pitch, he got up and basically flexed in his face, leading to Molina shoving him from behind, or not really shoving, it's sort of like a little, little bit more of a bump. And... That ended up getting him suspended, and of course, Cassianos is appealing it. And I believe one of the games he would have missed, but because he's appealing it, he got the play. He actually hit a homer against them, so there's that. (laughs) And Trevor Bauer tweeted at MLB, quote, MLB's note to players, don't get excited about big moments or play with intensity. We will find you and suspend you if you do. Hashtag free Nick Cassianos. Yeah, that I have to kind of agree with Bard. Cassianos was not out there sh- trading punches. He did do his little Hulk move. You know, Cassiano win, Cassiano home run, you know. <laughs> get down there in the pitcher's face. And he, I think, you know, some kind of reprimand. But looking at two-game suspension, it just seems, you know, it took him a, a year to implement that when they threw it on Ramos Chapman because he appealed it last year. And that was ridiculous. But I don't think. You know, when you feel like somebody's trying to throw a 100-mile-per-hour uh, ball at someone's head is the same as, you know, doing a Hulk, <laughs> Hulk staging or posing. Yeah, and it's not like he, you know, got up and shot the bird at him and mother effed him. He, <laughs> bas- he just, like, flexed at him. It's, it's like, come on, let's, let's have some fun here. It's baseball. Yeah. You, you, have a, you already have the reputation of being soft anyways let's let's get some excitement going this is what baseball needs <laughs> yeah I, I love it i love you know the, oh gosh mlb needs to lighten up on some things i i think that uh, if there was any penalties that should have been going it was some of those people who left the benches and did some fisticuffs because i don't think really castellanos did much of that no that he didn't really instigate anything to be quite honest at yeah. least in my opinion it was the guys that ran out there that maybe should have been in trouble Kind of like what they do in the NBA, where if you're, there's a fight and you're on the bench and you run out there, then you're suspended, I believe. That's what it should be. 
But staying with Trevor Bauer, he made his debut for the Dodgers in Colorado earlier this week, where he took a no-hit bid into the seventh and ended up going six and a third, giving up three hits, four runs, all of them earned, with 10 strikeouts, and he gave up a pair of two-run bombs in the seventh to end his night. So oh, not a bad debut, but the run count could be lower, but it's only his first start. See, and strikeout's pretty good. Did he do that with both eyes open? I, I believe he did, but maybe he did have one closed. Maybe he had one closed during one of those homers he gave up. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds about right. I love Trevor Barr. He's an outspoken guy, and he's one of the people who keeps baseball lively. We said it before time and time again, even though I know I'm not the biggest fan of everything that he does. I think he's really great for the game, and he's something that baseball does need to grow the game. Heading to D.C., the Nationals, they put 10 on the injured list before open, their opener on Tuesday. The Nats announced that starting pitchers Patrick Corbin, John Lester, catchers Jan Gomes, Alex Avila, first baseman Josh Bell, infielders Josh Harrison and Jordy Mercer, left fielder Kyle Schorber, and reliever Brad Hand have all been placed on the injured list. And though none of them were with a specified injury, an outbreak of COVID-19 sidelined 11 players with four of them testing positive, and that comes courtesy of ESPN. Okay, okay. National League East. Who's taking it on the chin last year and this year? I mean, what, we had the Marlins and the Cardinals last year? And and now we got the Nats bringing it along? Uh, that's, that's a little tainted. I don't know what goes on there, but wow. Yeah, thankfully nobody's had a very – a serious case of it. I, don't, I can't forget, remember his name. I apologize, but he plays for the Red Sox. He had it and I believe he's having heart problems and he missed last year because of it. And that's like the worst case of it. But I mean, look at the NHL where the, the Canucks, they can't play right now because all but maybe four or five guys on their roster aren't positive right now. And some of them are actually pretty sick. And a lot of people don't know what's going to happen to them. So Hopefully that doesn't happen with baseball, and hopefully those players get better, and hopefully this is closer to the end of all this. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. And uh, I know they're taking measures. I know some folks may feel a little bit more eh, freer this year to do things than they did last, but let's hope everybody stays safe. And sometimes we forget how serious that COVID can be, as you were talking with heart problems with one of the players from last year, so... Keep that in mind, folks. We also had two trades go down. The Brewers traded shortstop Orlando Arcia to the Braves for pitchers Chad Sabatka and Patrick Weigel. The Yankees also acquired a shortstop, Runyed Odor, from the Rangers for two minor leaguers. And two things to wrap up the show, just for all the fans out there. Remember, it's one week, so don't overreact whether it's good or bad. It's a long season, a long way to go. And a little bit more of a feel-good story. We talked about Mercedes earlier. Akil Badu, in his first at-bat, in his first pitch, he hit a home run. And that was in his very first game, his debut. In his second, he hit a grand slam. And in his third game, he had a walk-off hit to win the game in the 10th. And he was a Rule 5 pick from the Twins after having Tommy John in 2019. So hopefully ending the rundown there on a good note for all of you. Oh, I like that. That, that is huge. I I mean, it's fun, it's positive, it's exciting, and it's maybe it's an omen of great and good things to come. Well, you know, and, and looking at, uh, to see a couple of other fun things. Oh, speaking at first in the first week, going deep was Mr. Nate Lowe for the Rangers. Let's see, he hit uh, 465 feet. First one to hit 465 feet, and big, big congrats and salute to you, Nate, but oh, I don't think it was more than, was it the same day or a day later? Mr. Uh, Tatis Jr., he goes out there and hits 465 feet. The funny thing was, when I was doing research <laughs> on this, I, I couldn't find hardly anything on Nate Lowe doing, achieving that, but I found plenty on Tatis. I think Nate Lowe should have been given bonus points because it landed in the fountains out there at uh, Coffin Stadium. Yeah, that, that, that was hilarious. As long as we're talking about Rays, uh, if, for fun, I was watching Randy Rosarina. There's some footage of him, and he tries to keep his speed up. And he was doing some racing with horses. 
good old Mr. Lucky Boots horse racer, Randy Rosarina. And he is fun to watch him. So I'm looking more fun with that as well. Hey, as long as he doesn't hurt himself, he can do what he wants. You know, and that's, we talked about doing the right thing and doing what you want. And the Rangers, I found it really interesting that their governor, Abbott, he decided to allow everybody in for opening day. You know, he said, open the doors, everybody can come. And I hope everybody is safe from that, you know, that's, that uh, decision. And it's it's kind of weird, too. I was thinking about Brandon, the, that, uh, what, Toronto, I think, are playing with them. And Toronto, you, you couldn't go up. They're not open in their stadium. You know, you can't come up to Canada and play baseball right now. So it's kind of odd when you think of two different uh, ends of the spectrum. One, a park that is closed to having anybody, whether it be players or fans coming into it in Toronto, and a park in Arlington, Texas, where it's wide open and everybody can come. Yeah, I, th- I think it was the Rangers that made the decision to have the full house. I'm not sure because I think the H- Houston has it at 50%. You no, know, I mean, I personally wouldn't have wanted to go. That looked kind of uncomfortable to me, but I mean, hey, if you're an adult. You can make your own decision. If you want to go, hey, that's your decision. But it is interesting looking at, at some of the decisions that have been made. And like saying, Houston made their own above and beyond what the governor did. What's interesting, too, you know, I mean, thinking about the Texas governor, uh, he and a lot of other p- politicians, they had to say some things about the All-Star game being moved. You know, Manford and company decided that with everything that went on with the election laws down there, that they were not going to hold the All-Star game as scheduled in Atlanta. And a bit of hue and cry came out everywhere. Surprise, some of it was from politicians. And it sounded like this. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's that's the wrong sound bite. Sorry about that, Brandon. I was saving that for our, our movie review for Kong and Godzilla. But, you, you know, it kind of reminds me, though, of some of those 1960 Godzilla movies when you had these, like, old men in big old rubber monsters, Godzilla suits, jumping around back and forth, knocking down buildings, wreaking havoc, and, and not doing anything constructive whatsoever. So maybe maybe that sound is appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to think politicians have better things to do than worry about what a sports league is doing that has its own problems. They can leave that to us to criticize them. We'll be more than happy to do that. But, you know, they say, you know, athletes should stick to sports. Why can't we tell politicians stick to politics, you know? I'm with you. Maybe that's too simple. <laughs> well, simple is not in the world of politics. The complexity and insanity is. So God bless you guys out there, but stay the heck out of the game. We'll make our own decisions about how we feel about those. And if you'd like to see maybe some of the inner workings of how those decisions are made, David Sampson, a former president of the Marlins, he's got something on Nothing Personal, his podcast. Actually, it's on YouTube. Look it up, and he will walk you through the steps of how he thinks that process took place and how Rob Manfred came to that decision. Very enlightening. So check that out. I won't say more about it than that. Well, Brandon, I was planning on doing our uh, review of King Kong and Godzilla, but, you know, we're, we're running a little tight today. So I, I do want <laughs> yeah, well, we'll save the movie review for another show. Uh, but we <laughs> that do. sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I do want to share part one of that interview with Lou Schiff about opening day. And if you didn't know, Lou Schiff, he's a judge. He's an author and professor. He has a book out there entitled Baseball and the Law, which is very fascinating. Covers a lot of different court cases involving baseball. He sees himself as a Marlins fan first. I I had a little talk with him the other day. I was really curious to see because he did have tickets for opening day in Miami. And as a loyal fan and a ticket holder, I wanted to hear what he had to say. So we're bringing you right now part one of the interview with Lou Schiff. We'll play the other part next week on our Raise Up edition. Today, I want to welcome Lou Schiff once again with us here today on Baseball Biz. And it's all about, of course, opening day. It's been an exciting week. And I've had the good fortune of talking with Lou because he is one of the people who've actually been able to go out and enjoy opening day in a baseball park. And Lou, I know you as a diehard Marlins fan, 
opening day came April 1st and there was no April Fool's for you. It was there. You were in the stadium, man. That had to be an exciting was, event. It was, yes, it was. It was the, the first time in 18 months that I was able to go to a ball game. I had uh, received both my vaccinations by the end of January and it was kind of like a date circled on the calendar that if I'm healthy and I'm feeling good, I'm, I'm going to go down at the game. And I did. And so the plan was to get to Marlins Park two hours before first pitch. Uh, my wife, who was working that day, she said to me, uh, why would I be at Marlins Park on opening day two hours before first pitch? And I told her it was because it was the earliest time that they would let me in. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, yeah, it, I love that man. <laughs> if uh, if they had let me in uh, at uh, three hours before first pitch, I I, I would have been there three hours before first pitch. You know, opening day it's just a special day. It, it 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 reminds me of being a kid. It reminds me of everybody's tied for first place. No matter how bad a uh, outlook for your particular team is, uh, there's always that glimmer of you know maybe this is the year. This is the year we can do it. Oh, yeah. And opening day over the years has been a family day for me, going to games with my, my son or my daughter, my wife. You know, today marks uh, the 28th anniversary of the very first Marlins opening day at Joe Robbie Stadium. Oh, my gosh. And uh, April 5, 1993, took my, my son and my daughter. My son was all of three years old. My daughter was five years old, my wife. And we sat in the front row of the upper deck at uh, the old Joe Robbie stadium. And that was uh, opening day. It's just a great family kind of a day to do. It's, it's, it's just a special, the hot dogs taste better. You know, the beers <laughs> taste better and the, the peanuts taste better. It's just, everything tastes better on opening day. The fans are happy. Everybody's happy to be there. It's just a, a wonderful time. Uh, you know, it's, 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 how can you not enjoy opening day? It's, it's like, how, how do you not enjoy soft serve ice, ice cream? You know, <laughs> it's go hand in hand. I, I'm with you, man. I mean, I, I've been saying the last few weeks, Christmas is a coming. Christmas is a coming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here it is. It's, it's an exciting time. I mean, and you're talking about it being even like a family tradition. To me, that's something. If you could share and bring that together with other members of the family, that is huge. But now I, I do want to bring you back to this opening day. And I'm going to ask you some of the mechanics, a few things like getting actually tickets itself. Was that difficult? And what was the, how was that uh, all orchestrated? Well, well, for me, it wasn't difficult because I'm a season ticket holder. So I, I had the tickets. Uh, the one thing that the Marlins did is they moved my seats just a little bit uh, because of where they were. They said they, it was too close to an aisle and too close to a walkway. So they actually moved me back two rows, but that wasn't bad because there's nobody sitting in the first two rows in front of me. So, so they, they did that. Uh, they, they have at Marlins Park, they have seats in, in pods of five. And so I only have two tickets. And so I can sit anywhere in that pod of five uh, that I want to. And I, I took a friend of mine because uh, my son couldn't come down. My daughter didn't want to go. My wife was working. My brother, who I share the tickets with, wasn't able to go. So I took a good buddy of mine uh, to opening day. And we sat a couple of seats apart from each other in the pod. And uh, so this way we were, you know, kind of maintaining social distancing. And, uh, you know, Marlins Park, you know, people have asked me about, did I feel uncomfortable having to socially distance at Marlins Park? And the answer is no, because Marlins Park is the baseball stadium that really invented social distancing many years ago. So I've, it kind of felt like a game in the middle of July, not opening day, but from this field of the, the number of people in the stadium, it was quite limited. I know you were kind enough to share a photo with, uh, with me of, of opening day there. And, you know, and it looks like, you know, you actually have fan participation, but at the same time, enough room that you're not elbow to elbow or shoulder to shoulder with other fans. So that not, now, not, not in the seats. Now, on the concourse itself, it, it was a little bit crowded, uh, people walking around. And you, I, I kind of, we got there early and we, I picked up some food early, but the, the lines got a little long and I stayed away from the lines um, once the game started. They were, you know, the, that, that's tough to enforce because people were not really socially distancing. 
the team gift shop wasn't forcing social distancing rules, but that led to a long line outside of the team store and people were not exactly socially distancing there. But once yeah. you were seated in your seats, as, as, as this, you know, the picture that I have here shows you, uh, people are really sitting apart from one another. I wasn't sitting near anyone that I didn't know. Well, that works out well. I mean, and you yourself had been vaccinated. Now, I was looking at a Yankees game. They were actually asking people to hold up and show them a, a vaccination card. Was that part of the process when you guys came in? or what No, not about? at all. No, no. I think New York's a little bit different. Uh, no, uh, they didn't ask us to show them a vaccination card. Uh, they didn't even take our temperature. I don't think they took our temperature walking in either. Yeah. Uh, security was tight. Uh, they, they, in the last couple of years, again, last year I didn't go to any games. N- nobody else did either. But uh, they started, uh, they, they added fencing uh, around Marlins Park or whatever they're calling it now for the guys that paid $10 million to call it something else. But I'll still call it Marlins Park. I get to call it what I want to call it. Right. Like Joe Robbie Stadium. I, I still sometimes refer to where the Dolphins play as Joe Robbie Stadium. But um, uh, they have an extra ring of security. A uh, lot of uh, dogs uh, were there, you know, uh, dogs, you know, sniffing for, for I would imagine, uh, explosive devices. Right. So you couldn't get into the ballpark without them sniffing you. And uh, so the, the security, the security was pretty good there. And then you get into the ballpark. And like I said, uh, plenty of us uh, sanitizing uh, stations throughout the ballpark. Pretty much at the top of every section, there was a, a hand sanitizer that you can uh, squirt into your hand. Or they had um, the sheets, you know, where you pull them out and you, can, and, and you can wipe your hands as well. So it was, pretty, it was pretty good there. I had said to my buddy, I said, if I feel like this isn't really going to be a good socially distant experience like you have any problems if we leave and he was like no no if we don't feel comfortable we're going to leave and good we felt we felt comfortable except for the results of the game but we can talk about that in a little bit <laughs> yeah well i'm glad you, you felt comfortable in, at least getting in there and i'm like you I, get the opportunity to get in there two hours early to see see banning practice in the rest of it? Oh, I would absolutely be there. It was fun. You know, you got to see a little bit of batting practice and just to took a couple of laps around the stadium, just, just to walk around the stadium. And, and that was fun too. You know, got a little bit of walking in and saw some people I hadn't seen in, um, in a year and a half, you know, see other season ticket holders that, that I'm used to seeing on a regular basis. So, saw them and some people from the Marlins staff that I haven't seen in a long time. I got a chance to say hello. Uh, everybody had a mask on. Uh, everybody was like, I could tell you this, that all over the ballpark, people were really being courteous to one another by wearing a mask. Now, once you sat down, kept the mask on unless you had something to eat, but people were really abiding by masks on it the whole time. Well, that, that's encouraging to hear. I mean, to be able to make sure you can enjoy the game you know, there, but at the same time, being respectful of others and being responsible and, and with the mask as well. Wow. Though, <laughs> again, I envy you. I'm looking forward to when the trap opens. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not a season ticket or so we'll see when, if and when I get in there. I, I do want to come back to the stadium itself. And again, on opening day, what do you think? What do you think it's going to be like? Do you think there, I know you and I can only conjecture. Um, do you think we'll see a half a stadium by the mid, middle of the season? Do you think we'll see a full season sometime? Well, I, I, that I don't, that I don't know. I, I don't make, I don't make those decisions. Yeah. Uh, you know, as more and more people become inoculated and as more and more people start to feel safe to go outside, you, you, you may, you may see a larger crowd. Um, the Marlins could have had, I think up to 9,300 uh, for each game. Uh, I, I don't think they came. I don't think they came close to that. Both, I think the, the first game, they were a little over seven, maybe up close to 8,000. And the final two games, they were around low 6,000. So they can't put a couple more people in the ballpark. I think, it depends, how I think it depends on how the, from the Marlins standpoint, how, how the Marlins are playing in, in, in August. I mean, the Yankees will be here the second half of the year and the um, Cubs will be here the second half of the year. So I would imagine if they open up the stadium, they could sell a lot of tickets. Um, but how many they're going to bring in? I don't know. The Marlins have announced that for the first three months of the year, they're only going to go with like ni- maximum 9,300, about 22%. And then 
they'll go from there. I know when I was looking to get tickets, you know, a few months out from now on the Rays site, it wasn't available because I figure they're thinking, well, at that point, we may have a whole other, whole other way of selling tickets, or we have a whole other way of how many people what will be available and won't. So I'm looking forward to that. We'll see what happens. Looking to at at the past last year, beginning of the year, mate, dang on, you guys had a lot of difficulty. You all and the Cardinals getting, you know, started. It seems like National League East this year's experience of some difficulties too with the Nats and the wow. I mean, a couple of you, there's no game yet. Played yet, and I go, and they're not playing again tonight. I, yeah, I heard they're going to have a double header on Wednesday, I believe, with the Braves, the Nats. I'm not sure. I think it. But that's that's changing as we live and breathe here. But anyway, it's exciting time. I am happy to hear that the Marlins are healthy. Hopefully, all the rest of the teams will be able to maintain healthy as there as well. And it sounds like they have some good precautions in place. Sounds like people are being courteous and responsible to one another. So I'm really excited to hear that as well. I hope that translates when we come up to Tampa that we do the same thing here when we open in a couple of days. I would imagine you guys open up uh, Friday with the Yankees, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, uh, that's opening day. I would imagine that that's a tough seat to, to, to get for oh, opening day. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're a limited doing- number, I, I'm actually, I'm looking at your web. I'm looking at the Rays webpage right now and there are no seats available for yeah. opening day. Yeah. yeah. It's, they were gone quick. And one, no, unless started. you have a friend that has you no know, season tickets or something like that. That's exactly it. And the Rays always did best at selling, uh, this, I won't say selling out all the time, but when you had Yankees or Red Sox, mm-hmm. you would always have more of their fans in the stadium than Rays. You, you knew you're going to potentially sell out those games. So it should be an interesting start. And it is interesting to me. I mean, we're not getting to April 9th. You have April 1st. And it takes that long to get there. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, Lou, I tell you what, man, I'm excited for you guys. I'm excited for the Marlins and I'm glad you were able to have that in park experience. And I know that all the other fans and the players, the sound, the whole smell, all that coming together. That's what they go out of to mention about the sound. So I'd never experienced this before. The, the negative side of the ball game was they were pumping in extra sound. And, and, and as a result of pumping in the extra sound, it was extremely difficult to hear my buddy sitting two seats away, even though we both had masks on. That was no reason not to hear him, but they're pumping in all this extra sound. And that was very frustrating. And I left the game with a headache, not because we lost one, nothing. I left the game with a headache because they pumped in all the extra sound. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping when I go tonight uh, that it's a little bit quieter from the standpoint of, I don't mind fans cheering, but they've got that artificial noise. As somebody said, and I, and I agree with them, that it reminded them of going to a Miami Heat game where they, they pump in that, that, that extra sound. And uh, I don't like that extra sound. I, 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 know, I know when to cheer and not to cheer at a baseball game. You don't need to put Thank an you. extra sound. For me. Thank you. Yeah, we don't need the laugh track or the clap track when you actually have fans in there. And, and right. the players Absolutely know more. <laughs> Mark, you're, Mark, Mark, you're absolutely right. You know, I, I, it, there's, but they just pumped that sound in. So that was the negative. I mean, so that that was the negative for the day. The 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 pumping into the sound. That 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 was it. If there was one negative, that was it. Well, if that's it, I mean, I'm sorry you got the headache. I'll take Tylenol when I go to the park next time, just in case. But anyway, that's that's good. I'm I am envious. I am so happy you had that experience. I'm looking forward to seeing Marlins continually play strong this year. You know, if case people won't, don't remember, guess who won the World Series twice already? That's right, the Marlins. And they're playing in Marlins Park. <laughs> I'm still going to call it Marlins Park. <laughs> I, I mean, that's, that's, that's it, it's, it's what I know it for. I'm not even, you know, I, as I, re- I read one writer say that he's not obligated to call it by the new name because he's not, being paid by anybody to call it that. And in fact, he's now referring to it. He, he did a story about how many different names the team has had over the years. You know, there was Joe Robbie stadium and then it was land shark stadium. And then it was pro player stadium. And then it was dolphin stadium. And then it was dolphin stadium. And it was you know, just, just all kinds of names. So he's now decided to call it uh, land. What, how did he put it? Lone shark park. Oh, 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 okay. Not my joke, kids. Lone shark, but 
<laughs> took the names of you know Lone Shark Park. I thought that. Yeah, was I like the nice amalgamation, man. Hey, yeah, that was that uh, Craig, Craig Craig Calcaterra. Oh, uh, I, came up with Lone Shark Park. And if you don't know, folks, his buddy there, Craig, he also has a, a really fantastic newsletter. I think what is it called? Cup of coffee. Cup of coffee. Cup of, cup of coffee. But I want to thank you again, Lou, for being here today. My Lou, pleasure, Mark. Lou, of course, is also the author of the Law and Baseball, and a professor a jurist. And anyway, the main thing is he is a baseball fan of the Marlins and we welcome him once again. Look forward to talking to him again sometime here in the near future. Lou, have a great day and enjoy the season, my friend. Thank you, Mark. We'll talk soon. All right, buddy. Well, Brad, that was a, that was pretty much pretty good insight. I, you know, one of the things where he was talking about how the friendliness and how people were being courteous to one another and you know, most overall, you know, doing some social distancing. He said, I think some of it going through the corridors and food food courts was a little tighter. But but one thing that fascinated me too was what he had to say about piped in noise for the game. I mean, I thought I thought that would be illegal now because I mean, looking around the league and listening to games on TV, the crowd noise doesn't sound that much different than it does on on normal game days, anyways. So wouldn't Going back to pumping in crowd noise be considered illegal again? I would think so. I, I don't I imagine that was a Marlins decision. I hadn't noticed it at any of the other games. I don't know if they were doing it or not, but that's the only mention I've ever heard about it. I, mean, I don't think they mentioned it during the broadcast. So I was glad that Lou did share that. And like I said previously, that stuff gave me a headache. I mean, there were some teams in 2019, I just could not stand to listen to it. And even on the TV, so I'd wind up taking the volume down to nothing. I am excited about fans being in the stadiums. I'm hoping to be there soon. Right now, most of them are limiting it, sometimes 20 25%, some a little more, some a little less, some a lot more, Texas Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody, I wish you all to be safe out there. It's an important time. I'm starting to feel better. People are getting vaccines, et cetera, but continue to stay safe. And we're looking forward to being out there at the ballparks real soon. Yeah, stay safe out there. And slowly but surely, we're getting back to normal. And hey, maybe by when playoff time rolls around, maybe we'll have full stadiums again. Maybe even at the All-Star break. We'll have a, a full house there for the home run derby. I'll see you at Coors Field, Brandon. Yeah, that sounds good. That, that looks like a really nice stadium to go to. It does indeed. So once again, we want to thank all of you for joining Brandon and I here today on Baseball Biz. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Sports Blitz Pod. And you can find me, Mark, at The Baseball Biz on Twitter as well. And if you want to hear us where you are now, that's great. But we're also available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and all the other podcast directories out there. I want to thank you once again for joining us. And we look forward to talking with you again real soon. Special thanks to X-Take RUX for the music Rocky Forward.